Gail, how are you, man? I'm doing good. Very good today. Right. Great. All right, hey, guys, uh, this is Mike from Spot-Up Tactical Solutions, and I'm here with uh, Dale Comstock of dalecomstock.com, and uh, I'm, I'm very excited. Um, Dale's a very busy guy, and when I called him, he actually was doing an interview, so he's turning out of his crazy schedule doing an interview with me. And uh, he is a very gracious person. I called him yesterday, and Dale said he'd be honored to chat with me and talk about some of his story, and uh, I was blown away because you'd be honored to talk with him. So this is the kind of guy he is, stand-up guy. Uh, Dale has done a lot with his career, uh, but what's interesting is Dale doesn't define himself by what he's accomplished. Uh, he sees life as a process, and he continues to grow as a person and be involved in a lot of projects. So, I mean, Dale, you've done a lot. You, you did uh, 82nd Airborne. You served in Special Forces. You served as the uh, as a Delta Force operator. Um, you rose to the rank of Master Sergeant. So, guys, he's done a lot, uh, Somalia, Grenada, Panama. Um, you also have a Ph.D., a bodybuilder author. So I can list off quite a bit, but uh, you, you've done it all. Uh, how are you today, man? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, you know, I'm glad you know you said something that's kind of cool just now, and that is, you know, I don't allow myself to, to be defined by my past, um, but really I want to be defined by who I am today and in the direction that I'm going as a person. So, you know, my past is really, you know, it's the past, but it's, but it's, you know, those are the things that kind of have made me who I am today, but I don't want to be defined you know, I don't want people to know that, you know, Dale, you mean Dale Comstock is a Delta Force operator. No, I'm not just a, you know, I was a Delta Force operator. Um, you know, I'm a lot of other things, but ultimately I'm just Dale Comstock because, you know, has achieved a lot in his life. But, uh, um, but yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I did do another interview this morning for probably about uh, close to an hour, actually. Um, went a little longer than we expected, but, uh, uh, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, I'm definitely dialed in and, uh I'm happy to be here, and uh, you know, I, I like I like doing this not so much because what it does promote me. I'm you know, I, I'd be a lion if I said you know I, I don't realize that. But uh, what I really like is <clears throat> I want to be able to reach out to people, and uh, you know, and basically hope to inspire them and motivate them and give them something, some kind of information, something maybe they've overlooked or never heard of that when they 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 catch that they grasp it and go, oh wait a minute, you know, there's something to that. When they cling to it, maybe that will help them um, live a better life. <clears throat> I'm not saying they have a bad life now, but I'm saying improve their life, and enhance their, their their station, you know, wherever they are, in, you know, whether it's work or uh, in their personal life or whatever it is they're trying to achieve. So ultimately, that's what I wanted to do. Uh, you know, when I first started out in this, in this whole Hollywood thing, I, I never had a, you know, a plan to do anything like that. Uh, you know, I was working in the security field, and then I I got referred to uh, Discovery Channel for a show called One Man uh, One Man Army, and then uh, uh, from there things just started taking off. You know, I got called from NBC, and then before I know it, I had a, a management team surround me and created another company behind me, and 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 here I am today writing books, you know, making more TV shows, making more movies, um, and I'm not. And I don't want to be defined as, you know, Dale's a Hollywood actor now. No, this is something else that I do on the side. But, but I decided when I, if I'm going to do all this stuff, um, to not forget where I came from and really who I am, you know, uh, in my heart. And in my heart, you know, I'm always a soldier. My father was a soldier for 20 years. I went in, I was a soldier for 20 years. My son's in the Army. He wants to be a soldier for 20 years. So it's kind of in our in our pedigree, you know. And, and so – what I've decided that is if I'm going to do things out there, um, you know, I don't want to be known as a sellout, you know, like there's guys that become sellouts that, you know, they, they're chasing the dollar and the hell with everybody else. Um, I don't want to be that guy. I want to be that guy that represents, you know, the culture that I've come from, the military cult culture um, in a good light um, and show America and the world that, you know what, um, our military, our veterans, we're not a bunch of knuckle draggers. We're not a bunch of people that, you know, joined the Army because we couldn't find a JLB. Um, we're not a bunch <laughs> of losers. We're not a bunch of, you know, we're not a bunch of murderers or bloodthirsty thirsty killers, you know. Uh, you know, we really are good people. We are good Americans. We are good citizens. You know, we're good fathers and mothers, brothers. You know, we're the, all those things. At least we try to be. And, uh, and granted, there's, you know, we've got a few bad apples. But uh, ultimately, you know, as a collective, you know, uh, the military culture is head and shoulders above the civilian culture in every respect. And uh, and that's not to say that, you know, the civilians are beneath us or anything like that. What I'm saying as a collective, you know, um, 
I think, you know, I've, I've lived in both worlds, and uh, I, I scratch my head when I'm in the civilian world going, man, how the hell do they get anything done? You know, I mean, it's a, it's a slow process. You know, nobody can make decisions. Um, everybody's stabbing each other in the back, you know. It's just uh, there's all kinds of office drama. You know, there's so many weirdness, so much weirdness going on in this world. It's like, wow, you know, and how did we get to the world? We as, a, as, a, as, a, as human beings, how do we reach the place we are today in civilization, you know, if that's always been in our, our uh, you know, our DNA to act like that or, or, or in our history. So, um, so bottom line is, you know, I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to do the right thing. You know, obviously I'm trying to promote myself because it is my business now. Um, this is what I do. Well, it's one of the things I do, but I also want to make sure that, uh, you know, nobody will ever look at Dale Comstock and go, you know, he's a, he's a turd, man. He, he lost his way. He got where he came from, <laughs> right. and he's represented us in a bad light. You know that'll never happen. You know yeah. that's never gonna happen. So. But that's why you know one of the things we we had talked about yesterday was um, that you you wrote your book American Badass, and you know guys you can find it on Amazon dot com. Any any Google check is going to show you what Dale's accomplished. You know and he's a real deal. But uh, you spent a lot of time writing that book, and you want to be a good ass. So you know that book is about being a mentor and, and inspiring others. So you actually doing all you can to teach people to be all they can be. So uh, can you tell us about uh, what what a good ass is and how that came out of the military? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> funny, you know, because it, it really, it, you know, I, I have to laugh because <clears throat> when in my book, I hadn't even published it yet, but I published the cover and was letting everybody know it's getting ready to be published. And, uh, you know, a, a guy that I thought was a good friend of mine for many, many years, <clears throat> um, in fact, I've even hired him and, you know, some pretty lucrative jobs. And, uh, he contacts me one day and he just tells me, Dale, he goes, uh, we're no longer going to be friends. He goes, because he goes, I don't know, you know, you've lost your way. He goes, a badass doesn't have to tell people he's a badass. He, people just know he's a badass and uh, you're basically full of yourself. So we're no longer friends. And I, well, I was kind of taken aback by that. And I asked him, I said, you know, Hey dude, I said, you know, did you read the book? Obviously you didn't because the book hasn't been published yet. And I said, you're judging a book by the cover. And um, I said, the reality is my book's not about me so much as it's about you. It's about mentoring, inspiring other people to be better people, especially our young men. And uh, so, you know, and I chuckled because I told my wife, it's not about being a, a badass so much as it's about being a good ass, you know. Um, and if there's such a thing, but uh, – um, and that's what it's really about. You know, when I wrote the, the book initially um, – Actually, what happened was I never intended to write the book until I talked to Chris Kyle on the set of Stars and Stripes. And we said, BS, and he goes, yeah, and he goes, uh, I want to read your book. I go, well, I haven't read a book yet. And he wrote a book, you know. And he goes, well, you need to write one because I want to grow up to be like you. And I was laughing, and I thought it was kind of funny. It was actually a compliment. And uh, and uh, you got to remember, Chris Kyle is quite a few young, years younger than me. But, uh, you know, and uh, – when I thought about it, I was like, you know, a lot of people have asked me about this, and, and maybe I should do it. So when I approached my management team, I told them I, I want to write a book, but I don't want the book to be, you know, what I call a me, me, me book. You know, it's all about me, um, even though that's an autobiography. I said, I want to write something for other people as well. So I want to use my life stories as a medium uh, to guide, guide and inspire particularly young men, you know. Um, and then why did I say young men? Because, you know, I look at the way I've grown up, you know, um, and – what my father was like for me, you know, and, and I've mentioned this more than one time, you know, there's, I've got five mentors in my life um, that, you know, have kind of helped shape, you know, who I am. And that's, you know, obviously my first is my father, um, who was a military veteran, my German grandfather, my German uncle, um, and then there was uh, Gary O'Neill, who I met back in 1982, um, and at uh, Camp McCall, <laughs> he was one of the combatant instructors out there for the Survival Adventure Resistance Escape Course. And I looked at this guy and I'm like, wow, man, this guy is larger than life because I knew about his combat history and experience in Vietnam and watched the stuff that he did in uh, the martial arts world. And I thought, man, this is the guy I want to be like, you know. And so he's, I've always thought about Gary Neal as I went through the military, and he's always been the um, – uh, the example that I wanted to uh, to follow and become, and not be—I didn't want to be a Gary O'Neill, but I wanted to to adopt, um, you know, his uh, his warrior ethos, you know, his mindset and and what he represented as far as a soldier goes. I mean, he was in my mind, he's he's everything that Rambo wants to portray on 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 the movies and more. Um, and the other guy that was my mentor was a guy named Jim Smokey West. Jim was my martial arts mentor. You know, Jim was also a Green Beret. 
Um, but he had been training me in martial arts. He managed me as a boxer, as a professional boxer, and as a kickboxer um, as an MMA fighter since uh, 1992. We've been really good friends. And, uh, I mean, this guy has taught me more about fighting than anybody could ever teach me. They're just amazing guys. So these are the guys that have formed me and shaped me to who I am. Um, now, I'm not a clone of all these guys, but I'm an amalgamation of, of these of these guys' characters, their traits. Um, and I'm also, as I've stated before, you know, I'm also, you know, an amalgamation of the bad guys, you know. I, I mean, I've learned from the good and from the bad, and so that has created who I am today. Not saying I'm a bad guy, um, you know, but, you know, I've learned lessons from bad guys about do's and don'ts. Um, and, and actually, believe it or not, from some from some pretty bad guys, um, I've actually learned some 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 tricks for survival, man. I mean, uh, okay, you know, they're getting by with certain things because they're adopting this type of an attitude, for example. And I'm not going to sit here and give their names up and give them any credit because they are bad guys and they don't deserve <laughs> it. But uh, you know, you know. Uh, but anyway, so that's what the book's all about, you know. And um, I'm actually writing a few more books right now. I've got one in front of a publisher. Um, I've got another one coming out in June, which is called um, Apex Man which is more about uh, my uh, philosophy on life and, and how to do things and autogenic conditioning. This is basically uh, what I call, the, you know, the operator manual for Dale Comstock, you know, and, uh, and basically it's, you know, my, the way I view the world, the way I view uh, problems, you know, in fact, I don't have problems. Um, I have challenges, and, uh, and really it's a matter of perspective, but for me it works, you know, and I, t- and I Talk about what what's that mean? What's the difference between looking at something as a problem versus looking at something as a challenge? And uh, you know, for me as a as a warrior, as a competitor, um, when I have a uh, I'm confronted with an issue that has to be dealt with, you know, if I look at it as a problem, it's like oh my god, you know, I become reactive and I try to just try to make the problem go away and do what I got to do to make the problem go away. When I'm confronted with that same issue and I look at it as a challenge. I look at it like from the offensive standpoint, from the, so from a defensive standpoint, I look at it like, you know what, I'm to bring it on because I'm going to beat this and beat it good, and I'm going to get over this, and it's going to make me bigger and stronger. Um, and so it's a big difference. It's like getting into a fight, right? And, I'll, and this, these are the kind of things I talk about in my book. Um, you know, if, you get, if you're confronted, say, in a street fight, or let's say a boxing match, okay, I'll use my, my professional boxing uh I won't call it a career because it was short-lived, but, you know, if I got into the ring and I was intimidated by the other guy and I went in there fighting defensively, you know, I'm probably going to lose because I was scared I didn't, you know, and I was afraid he's going to hurt me, and he probably will hurt me because I was fighting defensively. And uh, any time you're fighting defensively, you know, you, you, you don't have control of the situation, okay? And, again, this is one of my, another little thing, uh, action that I use, and that is, you know what? Control the situation, don't let it control you. And so if I go into that same fight confident, knowing that, you know what, I'm going to eat this guy's lunch, I'm going to have fun, and I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and I am going to win, uh, it changes my whole attitude and the whole outcome of the fight. And, uh, and I'm more likely to fare well, even if I'm getting the hell beat out of me. You know, I'm, if, if I'm enjoying myself, even though I'm taking a beating, um, I'm more likely to fare better than if I'm fighting defensively. So, you know, these are the kind of things that you'll read in my next book, uh, Apex Man. And, uh, and I've got two more I'm writing, one for um, – and I've got a co-author with this, a guy named John Venuela, uh, an amazing, amazing, amazing writer. Um, I mean, really, and you'll see his work here pretty soon. But uh, we're writing another book about a World War II D-Day veteran. He's a 93-year-old gentleman, and, man, he just got some – I mean, it gives you goosebumps listening to his stories especially about the, the landing on, uh, on Normandy Beach. Um, and then we'll write another one about a special forces soldier, um, and basically he's a professional gambler as well. And uh, basically what we're going to discuss is uh, how his special forces qualities and traits have kind of helped him uh, in the world of professional gambling, which will be a very interesting story, I think. But um, So that's what I'm doing in the world of uh, um, you know literature and writing. <clears throat> um, I'm making a few movies. Um, I got one coming up. Uh, I got to go out and do uh, some filming next week, and then probably the week after that, another one. And then I won't mention uh, the famous actress. I've been asked to be on a, on a movie with her. Um, we'll see how that bears out. But uh, so I've got several movie opportunities and TV opportunities coming up, plus my books. I got survival DVDs coming out. So I got a lot going on. But ultimately, you know, at the end of the day, you know, everything I do in life, I try to remember one thing, you know, and that's veterans are going to be watching me. And am I, am I going to embarrass them or am I going to make them proud? 
not because of, you know they're proud of Dale Comstock. They're going. I want the veterans to sit back and go. You know what? You see that guy? That's who we are in the military. That's the kind of people that the military turns out. That's the kind of military. You know the kind of people that are in the military. And I want people to be proud of that. You know. And I want the rest of the world to go. Okay. You know. Much respect. Much respect for the military. And uh, and that's that's really my my mission at the end of the day is to to be successful on my own, but at the same time make sure that. Uh, you know, I'm representing, you know, my brothers and my sisters um, from from my other life. And it's really, I say my other life, it's really still my life because I'm still immersed in that, that culture. But I want to represent those guys in a positive light and hopefully blaze a better path uh, for them to follow down the road. Now, I, I know uh, that you're a grandpa, but, you know, you can kick the crap out of a lot of young guys. So uh, what's a typical training day for you? I mean, you, you know, you, you look in fantastic shape. <laughs> you know, um, I'm gonna be, I'm, I'm really, I'm gonna be really embarrassed to say this, but I haven't seen a gym in a while. I've been traveling like extensively since uh, August. Um, prior to August, I was in Hong Kong for about nine months, running a bodyguard detail over there for a billionaire, and then I came back, and then uh, I started doing some other stuff on my own, and I've been traveling. I mean, I've been, you know, I've been all over Europe, Indonesia, Africa, um, and then. Uh, spend very little time here, but when you're traveling like that, it's very hard to find a gym and get in there on a consistent basis, you know, and, and eat right and, you know, and even sleep because of the time differences. But I do do what I can do, you know. Um, if I had nothing else, I do some calisthenics in my room, I go out and then I do my push-ups and things like that. But fortunately, I've done enough training in my past that uh, I've got a good foundation and it's, you know, it's easy for me to maintain um, some level of fitness more so than probably the average guy. And uh, and it's easy for me to get back into the swing of things when I'm ready to. But, you know, as far as, you know, my athleticism is concerned, um, you know, I've always been an athlete. And I would say it's my athleticism as a kid that has allowed me to be a lot of things that I've done today. It's, it's, it's taught me how to be not only a team player, but it's actually taught me how to take care of myself and to, to be a, an individual player. You know, like a boxer and a kickboxer, there ain't no there ain't no team in that ring with you. You're doing this on your own, or you're or you're not. And uh, so I've, I've I've been in both realms, you know. And uh, you know, I, like I said earlier, <clears throat> I was a professional boxer, I was a kickboxer, I was an MMA fighter. I was an MMA fighter before MMA was even popular. Um, in fact, in 1996, I fought the first Valley Tudo match uh, up in Virginia, Richmond, Virginia, which was like the first one in the United States. Um, but I've got two six degree black belts. Um, and I've got a first-degree black belt in American Jiu-Jitsu. Um, and then I'm also a competitive amateur bodybuilder in the heavyweight division. So, um, you know, in fact, it's 19, not 19, it's when I was 47, so four years ago, um, I entered my first bodybuilding show with my son and my wife. My son at the time was 22. He's also heavyweight. And, uh, and both of us were side by side on the stage competing against each other. And uh, it was really cool, you know to be able to do that with my kid, you know, at that level. And, of course, my wife was in, in, her, cat, in uh, her category as well. So, you know, bodybuilding has been kind of a staple for me, and I like it not so much from the competitive angle um, because it is hard work. Um, it takes a lot of discipline, a lot of time. Um, but what I like about it is it makes – it forces me to take care of my body, which ultimately, you know, is the vessel for my mind, you know. Um, it carries the brain and it, and it carries my spirit. It carries everything. And if my body is my body's breaking down, my mind is breaking down. So, you know, they, they work hand in hand. I've got to take care of the body, which takes care of the mind, and the mind takes care of the body. You know, and uh, and that's what makes me who I am. And I feel like, in large part, has uh, contributed to much of my success. That's really good, man. I mean, I, I read the interview that uh, you had with Dalton Fury, and you said that uh, big muscles. Having a black belt or anything uh, external isn't going to make a difference for getting any special operations teams. And though a large part of it is is is, is working out, and I know you look great, is that you were uh, you were basically talking about um, visualization and self actualization. You know, you can visualize, but that's not going to make it come true. I mean, where does laser focus come from? What 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 motivates you? Is it your, your your kid, your 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 wife, is it God or? Now you know what that's a that's a good question too, and I and this is stuff that you know. I've said it before, and uh, I think it's important that people realize my motivation, believe it or not, okay, comes from my came from my father. My father's passed away now, two and a half years ago, but my father was my inspiration, and uh, and this goes out to all the fathers that are out there and the mothers. You know what? You know your kids 
are going to be what you want them to be or not want them to be. You know, the example that you set is going to have a huge impact on the direction they go. Yeah. And my father set a great example for me growing up. And uh, one thing he showed me was, you know, he's a loving, caring father, man. He took care of me and my sister. He never abused us. He was fair, and uh, he was good to us, you know. I mean, I, I mean, the guy was a gentle man, and, uh, and he was good to my mother. Um, he was just a decent human being, you know, and uh, and that really I've, – I've tried my hardest to be just like him and emulate, you know, his style as, as a father. And uh, – but when in, when I first joined the Army in 1981, uh, actually, I actually enlisted in 1980 when I was 17, and, uh, and then I finally told my father what I had done, and he was really disappointed in me because uh, my father – um, he had an 11th grade education. My mom had a 9th grade education. Nobody in my family had a college degree. He wanted me to be the first guy to go to college in the family and get that coveted college degree, you know. And when I told him I joined the military, he was really crushed. And so I felt really bad, too, that I hurt his feelings. But the reality was I really wanted to be a soldier just like him. I was used to the military lifestyle and, uh, and that culture. So I promised my father that, you know, no matter what, I would get my college degree and make him proud. And uh, knowing that, you know, I've hurt my father, um, I felt like I was always, um, you know, obligated to do my best, you know, to make him to make him happy, to make him proud, and, and make him never regret that, you know, I joined the military. And so, you know, that, that gave me the motivation and inspiration to do all the things that I've done, you know. I knew my dad would be proud of me if I could be a Delta Force officer, if I could be a Green Beret. You know, I knew he would be proud of me if I got my college degree. Hell, I took it a couple of steps further. I got my master's uh, before I ri- uh, retired, and I got my, uh, my doctorate of about seven years ago. And uh, <clears throat> so my father really was the driving force behind me. And, uh, and, I, and I always, I mean, that's what I did it for was my father. And, of course, I did it somewhat for myself. But always, ultimately, I always thought, man, what, what will my dad think? He's going to be proud of me, you know. And uh, that was my – that really was my inspiration. And when my father died two and a half years ago, uh, for me, it was like, um, you know, it was a, a dark moment because not only did I lose my hero, you know, and, and my – and the man that was always there for me, no matter what my problems were, he was always there to listen to me and guide me. But suddenly, I found myself all alone. And I'm like, who am I going to talk to? Who am I going to confide in? You know, my my father is now gone, and I'm all alone in this world. And who am I going to who am I going to do all these things for? And then I realized, you know, you, you know, you've got four other people in this world you got to do it for, and I've got four other kids. And so for those kids, I've got to continue to accept to set the example and uh, and raise the bar for them. And and so far, I'm proud to say my. You know, my two oldest kids both have college degrees. In fact, they both have two bachelor's degrees in each. My daughter's a successful business lady. Uh, my son decided after he got two bachelor's degrees, uh, he's going to join the Army. So he joined the Army um, as an enlisted guy of all things. He didn't even want to go in as an officer. And, and now he's, uh, he's an airborne infantryman. And, uh, um, and then I've got a 15-year-old daughter that's in JRTC. She's got promoted to sergeant. She works in AB And I've got a little five-year-old that's going to be a little badass. So for those kids, those are the ones I'm doing it for now, and not just my kids, but hopefully for other kids out there that need that guidance and inspiration that don't have it at home, um, you know, I'm hoping that I can set an example for them. And and I do have a lot of young men that follow me. Um, I, you know, sometimes I actually have young men that ask if they can spend the day with me, you know, and I've had a couple not too long ago came here and spent a whole day with me uh, from another city, and uh you know, when I had dinner, we talked. I told them about the military, and you know, showed them, you know, showed them the weapons and things that I have, and showed them to see my pictures in my in my office. And uh, you know, just spent the day with these guys, motivate them, and they both went on. One was the Marine Corps, and one was to be uh, an Airborne Ranger. You know, and uh, man, that makes me feel good. You know, that I can do that for you know for young people, and that's what I want to do. And so, to answer your question, it was my father. It really was my father that gave me the uh, the incentive, the motivation to be all that I can be. You know, and I, I mean, and I still live by that old army, uh, that old army model. You know, be all that you can be, and I, do, I live it even today. When I, when I look at a situation and go, man, you know, I, you know, that's interesting. I wonder if I could do that. You know, do I really want to do that? And I think to myself, why not? Be all that you can be, and just do it, and <laughs> knock it out. You know, and then knock it out and move on to the next thing. So that's that's that was my father that drove me. You know, that drove me in that direction. And uh, thank God he did. Thank God he was. You know, 
a, a good man for doing that. And, um, you know, I know there's, there's young people out there that don't have fathers, and, uh, you know, I'm sorry for them. But, uh, you know, there are people out there like me that are willing, you know, to set the, uh, to try to set the bar for you and, and give you give you that example that you need, you know. And I hope that uh, I can inspire many more out there like, you know, like some of these kids that I've already, uh, that I've already kind of mentored. I think you're doing a great job. I know that you had a curve back on a lot of stuff that you were doing. Uh, I think you were uh, training um, guys overseas, and, uh, you know, you'd be out there a lot more if you could, but uh, you work on your family. Uh, let me ask you a question, if we can, just get off the, the, the regular question. Yep. Um, what do you think what's going on with ISIS right now? I'm going to ask you that one. <laughs> yeah, you know, I get a lot of questions about ISIS. Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, but, yeah, everybody's asking me about ISIS, you know. And, and uh, you know, bottom line is this for me. You know, our our government, our administration has been, as far as I'm concerned, completely negligent um, in their handling of ISIS. You know, they've always been two steps behind them, um, and the reason why is they, they don't want to commit. You know, it started out last year when our president, oh, they're just a bunch of JV guys wearing, you know, L.A. Lakers uniforms, you know, we're a bunch of wannabes. And then, you know, he, he vowed that we would, would not commit to the war, we would, you know, send anybody. And then he's like, okay, well, we're going to send uh, aircraft, you know, and uh, – and, uh, apply surgical strikes and uh and uh and and then uh that's why my daughter just walked in <laughs> had no to me that our dog just pooped <laughs> my our dog just pooped <laughs> so <laughs> like okay got it yeah, my, my wife got a new uh a new puppy and that thing's been a mess man literally making a mess but um so um but yeah you know we we We've been slow to respond, and and as I, I use the um, analogy of cancer, you know, um, this started out as a cancer, you know, and we were behind the eight ball trying to treat it, and uh, and then we started, you know, we sent in airstrikes, which had very little, um, you know, very little impact, you know, it makes the, the general public, you know, Americans feel good, like yeah, we're dropping bombs on, well, you know, that's really cool if. If ISIS was, you know, firing and maneuvering in mass out in the open, and we're dropping bombs on them, you know, like a like a uh, a pallet bomb or something, a Moab, and knock them out. But that's not how they operate. You know, these guys are moving in small. They're using guerrilla warfare tactics. You know, and so, um, you know, what we need is, you know, we need boots on the ground, but we don't need a conventional army. You know, of infantry and tanks lined up to go get them. Um, we, what we need is special operations on the ground. To do those uh, those surgical strikes from the ground and 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 basically carve out this cancer wherever it's, it's uh, wherever it's metastasizing and the reality is, you know, Americans are kind of like of the opinion, no, ah, no way will I just come over here and attack us. There's too many of us. Blah blah blah. It's like they think that these guys are gonna, you know, I use the analogy of a C5 that ISIS is all gonna get a bunch of C5s and fly over here, land on the freeway, get out in the mass, you know, overrun the country. No, that's not yeah. what they're gonna do. What they're trying to do and what they are doing. It's through social media, um, social networking. And basically they're trying to uh, spur, you know, um, sympathizers in our country to act as surrogates for them and get these guys, right. get these people over here, uh, you know, and to start doing the deeds on behalf, doing that dirty deeds on behalf of ISIS. And, uh, and so that's how it's going to happen. And it, it's already happening. It's happening in our country. It's happening around the world and other countries that I've visited. You know, ISIS is starting to have a presence everywhere. And, uh, and so, as I said, you know, this thing's like a cancer. It's metastasizing. And, uh, you know, we're, we're coming in now trying to, you know, we're constantly behind the eight ball trying to treat it. And, uh, and, and, and the treatment is like it's taking forever because, you know, it's like the doctor standing there twiddling his thumbs going, should I give him this medicine or not? Should I give him this medicine or not? While this thing's just growing and growing and growing, you know, it's spreading. And right now, like Army ants, man, these guys are overrunning, you know, you know the large regions in the Middle East. And uh, if they go and check, we're going to have a major problem later on. So that's, you know, that's my take on ISIS. Um, they're winning the PSYOPs war. They're winning the social media war. And, uh, you know, they're really war wearing, they're winning the ground war. I mean, good Lord, man, how many people do they have to kill? How many people do they have to burn alive? How many children do they have to kill and rape? You know, how many Americans' heads do they have to cut off? It's enough. You know, and, uh, and I, I would even go so far as to accuse our commander-in-chief of being complicit. And, the, and he's murdered because he's not doing anything when he has the capability. Mm -hmm. You know, American soldiers will go and do the job if they're allowed to go and do it, you know, unrestrained. You know, I made a comment uh, on IJR Review that, you know, if he lets special forces go over there, 
You know, drop you know, drop the leads and let the dogs of war run, man. You know, don't let them try to fight with the leads on because we're not going to get nothing done. If you would yeah. just do that and let them our military do what it can do, um, you know, it'll be over. Just like Afghanistan, we created Afghanistan. It's almost as fast as we started, but we put so many restraints, you know, on the military and um, you know, and rules of engagement, you know, that you know it's. It, it got bogged down, and the longer it got bogged down, the more rules that came, and the harder it becomes, you know, the, became to fight the war. Um, we got to go in hard and fast, think right off from the outset, if we're gonna, you know, if we're gonna do anything significant, um, you know, to these guys, to this threat, and uh, and make and make no bones about it, man. They are terrorists, you know. They are terrorists. They're not just one old teenagers that couldn't get a job and picked up arms, so you know, they have nothing better to do. You know, no, these are terrorists, and, and I hate it when, you know, our government can't acknowledge that yeah. um, because these guys have clearly, clearly stated that they're motivated, you know, by, you know, by religiosity, by, you know, by their faith. It's what the driving force is for them. It's not socioeconomics. You know, it's religion, and we need to, right. we need to just stop playing politics, you know, stop BSing the, the public and call it what it is. You know, it's a war on terror, man. You know what? It's not a war on Islam. Although Islam, you know, the Muslim religion is 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 kind of the driving force for these guys, um, but it's really it's a war on terrorism, and and let's call it what it is, you know, and yep. uh, and it stops sugarcoating to, to be politically correct. I appreciate you taking time to answer that. You know, um, let, let's talk about uh, some of the kind of fighters that are out there. Uh, as far as movie characters go, um, who do you relate yourself to? You know, it would be Man on Fire. I mean, uh, Clint Eastwood. Uh, who do, who do you see yourself being more like? <laughs> Man, I, you you nailed it, dude. I Clint Eastwood is my hero. Always has been as a kid. I have seen all of his movies probably a thousand times, man. Good, bad, and ugly, a few dollars more. I mean, all of them. The guy is just my hero, man. I love his his character. Um, I love his roles, you know, and uh, and what he and and what he the roles he plays. And I'm like, man, that's that's the kind of guy. Reminds me of my father a lot, you know, but uh, I really look up to this guy, not only as an yeah. actor but and a producer, but really as just a, an American, man. His head's in the right place. And, uh, you know, I, I look at him, and believe it or not, man, I love Denzel Washington as an actor. Man, I mean, he is by far probably my, one of my favorite actors behind Clint Eastwood. Um, I mean, and I, I love Man on Fire. I, I've watched that a thousand times. There's just something about that movie that just keeps my attention. It keeps coming, <laughs> be coming back. I mean, it's deep, and it's just, man, it's resounding to me. So, yeah, yeah both movie. those guys really are on the top two, of, uh, two top two guys on my list of actors that I really, really admire. And of course, you know, I really love Terry Crews as well. I got to know Terry Crews on Stars and Stripes, and uh -huh. – you know, the guy's a very talented uh, actor, man. I mean, he can do everything. And uh, he's funny. You know, he can be serious. Um, I mean, he's just off the chain. And the thing is, he's super smart, man, super intelligent, super funny. And uh, he's very consistent in everything he says. I mean, you, I've, you know, whenever I talk to people, especially when I first meet them, I'm always looking for inconsistencies in their stories. They're a little grayer. Things are going to make me go, is this guy really – all that, or, you know, he, he, he BS me. And uh, I've never found that in Terry Crews, man. He's always been straight up, man. He's just straight up. He's smart. He's a good guy, you know, and uh, much respect for this, for this man. And uh, I love Terry Crews as well, you know. I could never be a Terry Crews as far as an actor goes. He just, he's just so multi-talented. There's no way I could do all the things he does, you know. He's just, he's just that damn good. I see myself more as a, not so much as, um, I see myself more as a serious type of character, um, you know, whether it's a bad guy or something like that, kind of a Clint Eastwood character. But I don't see myself having that diversity like uh, like Terry Crews, where I can also be, you know, a comedian. You know, I'm just uh, oh yeah, he was great. But right now, I just don't feel confident enough to do that. You know, so, yeah. yeah, he was great. In, uh, yeah, he nailed it, man. Yeah, the President of the United States. Yeah, good in that movie. Uh, how about uh, American Sniper? I mean, you, you, did you knew Chris Kyle uh, for a short while or, or a long bit maybe? But uh, what were you thinking about the movie? Was it bang on? Yeah, I, you know what? I have not seen the movie yet because I've just come back. Uh, I was in Indonesia for a while, and I just came back this week. Uh, I intend to go see it, but uh, I did know Chris Kyle. Um, I knew Chris Kyle, and, uh, you know, great guy. Love Chris Kyle, man, you know, and uh, much respect to the guy. Um, and, you know, I, I, I was really, you know, I was really kind of taken aback by, you know, Michael Moore's comments about Chris yeah. Kyle. And, uh 
And when I was contacted by uh, IJR Review, and I was asked, "Hey, would you be willing to, uh, you know, would you be willing to write a, a, a commentary about this uh, this issue?" And I said, "Man, I said, give me about 30 minutes just to make sure I do my research and I don't uh, speak out of school." I said, "Call me back," and, and I said, "I'm ready to do this." And uh, and I let and I let go. And uh, you know, obviously, I freaking buried uh, Michael Moore. I hope he saw it. And uh, and uh, I, I'm still waiting for him to, to, to. Well, he did actually kind of shoot back indirectly. Um, you know, he made a comment about uh, he tried to help more um, soldiers, you know, not by being a sniper, but trying to keep us from getting killed, you know. And uh, and then he went on to talk, claim that he had bodyguards, there were special forces in fields, which I call him out on all that crap. Uh, I know it's BS. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, I just, there's, there's no way, you know, I, I get really pissed off when I, when I hear about uh, Jesse Ventura, you know, still suing uh, Chris Kyle's family, you know. And, uh, and attacking them, and then, you know, and then I heard Michael Moore come along, and I'm like, you know what, I wish I could do something, and I was given the opportunity. I'm like, you know, there's no way I'm going to let, you know, Michael Moore set his platform on the backs of Chris Kyle and the rest of his veterans just to give himself a little bit more popularity and to, uh, you know, to throw the rest of us under the bus. Um, and, you know, and people have said, well, you know, don't, don't, don't comment because that's what he wants, you know, he wants that notoriety, and you know, and, and that's what he wants, you know, and I'm like, yeah, but he's going to get that either way. Why? Because he's got a big mouth, he's got a far reach, um, he's got a big audience of liberals that are going to listen to him, and they want us to shut up, you know, they want us to be quiet, and I decided, no, I'm, I'm shooting back, you know, and, uh, and I'll do it in a way that, you know, he can't, he just can't argue with, I'm going to make him look like an idiot, and uh, so, you know, that's how that, that all, uh, you know, all came about um, with me, you know, writing that article um, in response to Chris Kyle because I decided, man, nobody's going to trample my friend, you know, a dead friend, of, you know, um, and, and get away with that. So, you know, I felt obligated to come to his defense and hopefully hopefully at least, uh, you know, um, bring more attention to the issue, which, yeah, it'll bring some issues to, to Michael Moore, but I thought – and a lot of negatives by issues because I, I think I effectively buried him. Um, and then what it also did is brought more um, – uh, focus on Chris Kyle and his family, and I hope that more people went to watch the movie and paid more money for it, you know. So I'm hoping that I benefited him and his family and uh, definitely degraded uh, Michael Moore's standing, uh, you know, in, in in the world. Well, you know, you, we were talking yesterday, uh, talking about celebrity. You use yours for a positive thing. A lot of these guys like Moore and uh, uh, Ventura are going off the deep end, and they're just talking trash. Um, but you're using yours for a positive thing. And uh, you're all talking about OPSEC. You know, what, what do you think about, um, I think it's uh, Anil, the guy who claims to be the shooter for Osama bin Laden. I mean, uh, as far as talking about a book or what happened, um, what were your thoughts about him talking about what he accomplished or supposedly accomplished? Should he well, have come I, out I and said that? A, yeah, I've actually written a blog on that, too, with the IJR Review. And uh, <clears throat> I, I can tell you I've got firsthand knowledge um, who this guy is and what he's really all about. And I'll, I'll just leave it at that part right there. But uh, – you know, there's many out there that claim that guy was not the shooter. Uh, first, first thing I'll make, first comment I'll make is, he's disgruntled because he got out of the military after 17 years and he's not receiving any benefits. Well, you know what? Every veteran that knows, goes into the military knows that in order to receive retirement benefits, you've got to do your 20 years. Okay, so he gets out at 17 and somehow thinks that he's entitled to some kind of benefits. Well, he should have done his other, his other three, and uh, and then he would have gotten what he had coming. Uh, so that, well, that was my first argument, um, and then and then at this point, you know, what he did was it's obvious the guy is trying to elevate himself to some kind of status um, of being, you know, this, you know, I'm the sniper, and and he's actually, you know, he's actually told my management team that he's he's the brand, you know, basically he's calling himself a brand. I'm like, no, you're not a brand. <laughs> you're just a you're just a former seal that was in the same place with everybody else that may or may not have shot a target. But you didn't do anything that nobody else in the military would have done. You know, every Ranger, uh -huh. every Green Beret, every Delta operator, every SEAL, every Marine, you know, yeah, there's probably a bunch of people out there that are in support services that would have loved to have the opportunity to pull the trigger and shoot that guy and would have willingly done it at their peril. Uh -huh. um, he just happened to be in the right place at the right time. He didn't uh -huh. get selected because he was the best of the best of the best. He just happened to be in the right place at the right time, and I don't think he shot uh, Osama bin Laden. Uh, I think he's a liar, and that's my personal opinion. Um, you know, he's got, he has to prove it, and he can't prove it, you know, and, and 
So he expects everybody to take his word for it. But he's already lost credibility in my book for two reasons. One, you know, he made the comment about not getting any benefits after 17 years. And then when he was asked, you know, well, why are you doing all this? You never hear Delta Force talking about stuff like this. And then he, what did he do? He fired back. Well, that's because Delta Force doesn't do anything. And then, you know, and I can tell you right now, you'll probably never go to Fort Bragg. Uh, he'd be smart not to because the first Delta operator runs across him will probably pummel the guy, uh, you know, <laughs> for that comment, you know, because right. they are the truly the quiet professionals. You don't hear nothing about it. It's not because they're not doing anything. They're doing stuff all the time. They've been doing things before the wars ever started. Um, you know, they are America's secret army. And uh, and they also are the quiet professionals. They don't have to go out and tell the world, look what I did. Let's make a movie and write some books, you know, and then stab my brothers in the back and start fighting on, with my teammates about who shot UBL. Uh, they are the consummate true professionals. And this guy is doing nothing more than embarrassing, you know, the, the community. He's embarrassing his field brothers uh, by by doing that, you know. And uh, it's regrettable because, you know, civilians are looking at us looking at him, looking at the rest of the veterans, going, man, is that what you guys are like, a bunch of little girls fighting on the playground, you know, about who shot who? Who cares? You know, it, I got a message for you, O'Neill. You were just doing your job. That's all you were doing. You're not a superhero. You're nothing, nobody special, period, you know? So, you know, who cares if you yeah. shot BUBL or you shot, you shot just some Taliban dude, you know, some Taliban farmer. You shot a dude. So what? Like everybody else, you know? And, uh, and that's my take on it, man. I, I think he's just a total douchebag, and I'll tell him that in his face. I look forward to the opportunity to meet him someday. You know, uh, they did classify it, but you were in Grenada for your first time in combat, but I believe it was, uh, you were talking about Mandela Prison, that's where you made your bones. So, uh, you know, yeah. we, we didn't find out about that until a long time after, a long time, but Anil was ta talking about it right after. Um, can you talk about the uh, Kurt Muse thing for us? Yeah, yeah, because that's, that's not, uh, you know, that's not classified. <laughs> um, Actually, there's a couple of movies or a couple of shows out on Discovery Channel about right. that. Um, Kurt mm -hmm. Muse talked about it in his book, Six Minutes of Freedom. Um, but, yeah, the, you know, that was considered the, one of the first uh, successful rescue, hostage rescue missions in, US, in uh, modern U.S. military uh, history. And, uh, and uh, you know, Kurt Muse, you know, he claims that he was a, just a business businessman over there and he belonged to a rotary club and basically got rolled up by Noriega's regime for um, – um, uh, basically is spying through signal intelligence, you know, using, <laughs> using his radios. Um, you know, I'll let, I'll let everybody else make the decision who he really was or was not. But that's, that's the story from Kurt Muse. Um, but anyway, he ended up in uh, Modelo, which means it's, it was a model prison. Um, and he was, you know, being held there. And then all these other things, these other precursors uh, basically transpired, people getting shot, and then led up to the run-up to the war, and the final decision was made. All right, you're going to get Kurt Muse out. That's going to start the war. So we got to get him out first, and then uh, everybody else is going to roll in, and we're just going to get this over with. And so um, we, you know, we, the union, we spearheaded the invasion. Um, that's why I spearhead on my expeditionary mail, because we were actually, you know, the guys that started this whole campaign with the rescue of Kurt Muse. And I was a preacher on that mission. Um, I went in. I was on one of the MH6 Little Birds. Um, I jumped off and on the roof and then ran to the uh, there's an annex on the top of the building, about a 10 by 10 annex, I guess. And um, I ended up, uh, <clears throat> my job was to breach the, the main door to get, you know, to get us inside, to go down to uh, the second floor where Kurt Muse was being held. And uh, funny thing was, you know, <laughs> is I was given intelligence from the agency that I would go up against a, a solid steel door. And so, you know, that's how I basically started constructing my explosive charges. And I thought about it. I was like, well, you know, when on the top of a building, it's an annex. There's nobody going to be behind the door, at least not no good guys. And uh, I said, you know, I don't have to calculate it exactly for, you know, this door. I can I can put a little extra on there uh, just make that on sure I get in. And it's not going to affect anybody or anything, you know, or the breach. So, you know, I, I, I laugh about the P factor, P meaning uh, plenty. So I put, you know, the P factor was in effect. I put plenty of explosives on my charge and I uh, pumped it up quite a bit. And uh, and then uh, it's a good thing I did because when I ran up to the door, um, you know, to, to kind of put it in context for you, it was uh, 12, 20 midnight, right after midnight. It was dark. As soon as we came in, all the firing started, all hell broke loose. And uh, the lights started going out. 
Um, we started taking a lot of fire from the, from the ground. We were taking fire from the guard towers. We were taking fire from across the street from the commandantia, um, and uh, it was on. And so when I got up to the door, um, you know, in this firefight, I'm looking, and to lo and behold, yeah, there's a steel door there, but in front of the steel door about four to six inches is a jail door. And uh, so I've got two doors that have got a breach with one charge. And the problem with the jail door is it's got bars on it, so I'm not getting good charge to a surface contact. So I'm going to lose a lot of my explosive force uh, right. without, that, uh, without that contact. So you know, I had no choice. I'm like, well, i got to go with what I go. It's either going to work or it's not. <clears throat> so I placed the charge, um, had a couple of faux pods, but ultimately – um, I blew the charge, and, and fortunately, I'm glad I put an extra explosives on there because I needed that. It mm -hmm. actually drove the, the uh, jail door through the steel door and sent both doors flying across the, uh, the, the room to the other side of the annex and slid them down the wall nice and perfect and out of the way, like flying Great. plates. So um, it worked out really well, and we, you know, we initiated the assault inside. We went in, took care of some of the uh, bad guys and the interrogator that was uh, holding Kurt Muse. And then uh, recovered him, got him out, got him on the aircraft, and then uh, coming off the roof, his aircraft gets shot down. And so <laughs> it crashes down the street in an alley, and uh, nobody knew that. Um, all the birds left, and actually my bird was supposed to be one of the last birds to return to Howard Air Force Base, and it was the first and only bird to come back. And I thought, well, that's kind of odd. Where did everybody else go? And uh, <laughs> so my team leader got off the helicopter, and he, yeah, he told the rest of us, you know, just remain put, and he walked over to the J-Mount, which is the medical uh, unit, they were all standing or lined up waiting, you know, all the surgeons and everybody was waiting. And, uh, you know, and uh, he goes over and they're having a discussion next time. He comes running back. He tells us, uh, you know, load a fresh magazine. We're going back into, uh, you know, into the, the target because, you know, the uh, the precious cargo bird was shot down. And yeah. I'm like, oh, smoking. You know, you know, that's when I got scared. I wasn't scared until at that point because we just come off the target. And, uh, I mean, it was just a raging firefight, man. There was, you know, we had um, – um, the one uh, – I'm having a brain fart right now, but we had a, a mechanized infantry unit that was there, and uh, a lot of, it was during the Christmas season, so a lot of the guys were gone to the United States uh, for Christmas. So the ones who were left behind were – they were, cl you know, clerks and cooks and mechanics, and they're managing they're, – you know, they're managing these APCs and, and firing these uh, 50 caliber machine guns in support positions on the street for them. And uh, these dudes are just blasting away, man. <laughs> and they're shooting everything that moves. You know, it's pitch black <laughs> out, and they're taking a lot of fire, and they're turning fire. And yeah. I'm coming off the roof. I got these what looks like flaming basketballs coming right up under our feet, you know, in a helicopter, and they're 50 caliber tracers. And uh, and I'm like, holy smokes, man. So I realize we're going to have to go back. It means we got to fly back through all that crap, you know, and, and risk, you know, again, getting shot. Yeah. And we get shot up our own guys and stuff. And so right as we started spinning up to take off, you know, we were told to stand down, and the rest of the birds came in, and we found out they had just recovered uh, Kurt Mewis and the rest of the guys in that bird that, uh, you know, they had several casualties, but they managed to uh, collect everybody off and get them out of there, and, uh, you know, the mission was a success. So, you know, that was uh, that was the night of Modelo Prison um, <laughs> back in uh, 1989, December 20th. Major story, man. You kept your head, too. Uh, you also think yeah. you guys uh, – you, 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 you train the way you guys fight, so, um, you know, uh, you, you kept it together. Um, one question for you. I mean, any pearls of wisdom that you're going to – would you like to give our audience? Anything? Yeah, you, you know, actually, you know, you're right. Train the way you fight, you know. Train the way you can do anything in life. Um, you know, that was the philosophy in the, in the unit was, you know, we, we didn't use blanks. Um, not mm -hmm. saying that we never did. But that's not what we – we used live fire, you know. We set up bullet traps. Um, we did what we had to do. So we're actually shooting our weapons with live ammunition, using live ordnance on everything we did. And, uh, and, and and so, like, when we went into Modelo Prison, for example, it was very surreal because, you know, I, was, I wasn't nervous. I wasn't scared because it seemed like a training event um, because we've yeah. done so many like that. The only difference was – when I was sending bullets down range, they weren't going into a bullet stop. They were going into people. And, yeah. uh, you know, and they were falling down, and, and play, you know, and they were dying. But, you know, in in uh, in our training scenario, they would fall down and, and role players and pretend to be dead. So from that perspective, you know, it had very little uh, consequence, you know, on my psyche um, going in until after I came off the target. And, uh, you know, and was able to 
assimilate and really digest all this carnage that just happened and that it was real. That's when I got a little nervous, like, man, you know, this, this is not, this is really not training, you know? And, uh, mm-hmm. but so, you know, to the, to the point about training the way you fight, even in, um, everything else that you do in life, you know, what, you know, I'm just talking about, you know, like combat, the military, but, uh, you know, whatever it is you do in fight, you know, like, for example, um, when I trained in martial arts, um, you know, I trained with Jim Smokey West. Jim Smokey West, you know, he's not a guy that judges you and promotes you based on how well you can do a kata and a form and, uh, you know, those types of things. He basically promoted you on your ability to really actually fight. So when you tested, you know, you're basically going to be in a fight. It was a sanctioned street fight. And, uh, and that's how you, you know, that's how you, you, you earned your strikes. And, uh, I can remember one time, um, I was getting my, earning my, first or second degree black belt, I can't remember now, and my daughter was going to earn her second degree brown belt, and we all went up to Richmond, Virginia to another school, and the, and uh, we met the instructor there, as all was planned out, and basically everybody, the only people that were there was me, my daughter, my uh, my instructor, Jim West, and then the other guy, the other uh, martial arts uh, instructor, who was a six degree black belt at the time. And his, uh, one of his students, uh, a female who was a black belt. And, uh, basically my daughter and his, his, uh, student basically went out and had a street fight. You know, we closed all the doors, locked it up, and they went at it, you know, and, uh, basically, you know, it wasn't a matter to see who was, a question of who was going to win or not. If my daughter lost, she was not going to be promoted. No, that wasn't, that wasn't the test because she was already fighting a black belt. But, uh, you know, did she apply what she has learned, um, and did she do it with confidence uh, in a real in a real match? And she did, of course, and she got her second degree black belt. And I did the same thing. I had to fight the sixth degree black belt. And basically, we went out there and it got it on. And uh, and actually, I'm happy to say I pretty much beat him up. And so either way, I was going to get promoted. But uh, that's how that's how we you know that's how I earned my belts. I trained the way I was going to fight, and I fought the way I trained, which was you know they were in, they were the same thing. Um, so, you know, that's everything you do in life. You know, you want to do it as realistically as, as you can and, and try, if you've if you got to simulate, try to simulate as realistically as you possibly can, um, you know, to, to get you to, you know, really have peak performance. And so that's my attitude about everything that I do, um, you know, is, is try to as best I can to actually to mimic the real situation. And even if, even if I can't <clears> – <throat> um, I can't really train or rehearse something because it's just not practical um, and I can't do it, then there's another technique called autogenic conditioning where it's visualizing what you're going to do. And the other part, and, and with that, you know, said, basically what I do is I, it's a, I create a what-if scenario. I said, what if this happens? What would I do? You know, even though I can't mm-hmm. actually do it right now, I can't, I can't create the scenario, what would I do? And in my mind's eye, I see a response. I formulate a strategy. And I said, that's what I would do, and, okay? And now what I've done is I've put um, a solution, you know, in the data bank. And so if that time ever comes, at least I've got something. I can do something rather than standing there like a deer in the headlights going, okay, what am I going to do? And I'm trying to figure it out under duress when it would have been a lot better if I already had a solution. Maybe it was the right solution or the perfect solution, but at least I'm doing something and not just standing there and uh and becoming a, a victim you know <laughs> um and that's that's the attitude that i take on everything i do i try to if i have to what if it i what if it and i'll come up with a solution and at least i got a solution you know like i said i've got a solution on standby just in case i need it you know it comes off the shelf and we implement amazing story man i mean just everything you've uh just blessed us with your time being able to tell um guys you know he, he's done it all 82nd airborne special forces delta force operator uh, Dale, you, you're, you're living it. You know, you're, you're writing books and you're getting out there trying to change uh, people, and you're also transforming yourself. And um, I again appreciate you just taking the time out of your day to uh, do an interview with, with, for us. Um, well, guys, if you get a chance, uh, I want you to go out there and check out DaleConstock.com. You can uh, get his book. You've got a couple. Uh, well, you've got a couple movies coming out, uh, or well, one, one's out now, and another couple others in the can. Um, yeah. Yeah, I've actually got one. Uh, I just I just filmed one back in uh, late November called Texas Zombie Wars. Um, that's almost finished with editing. It probably will be out in about uh, four to six weeks. Uh, I did one last year called Zulu Six, and we had a little issue with uh, the editors, um, and uh, we ended up having to take all the material back, go to another editing company, and have it redone again. So 
that one should be out by April, May time frame. Um, and then I've got, uh, I'm slated to do uh, actually two more movies. Uh, one, uh, I was just called it on it the other day, um, where I'll be, uh, probably, I won't, I won't mention the actress's name yet because it's not been uh, um, solidified, but a uh, pretty popular actress. I might be on a movie with her. And then I've got another movie that I've been asked to do where I'm basically playing a a bad guy um, or good guy turned bad guy or bad guy turned good guy. I can't remember which one it was, but so uh, I've got a few other ones in the uh, iron and I just, I'm filling out an application now for another reality show that uh, I was asked if I was, would be interested in. So I'm still doing some great. TV movie shows, you know, and things like that. And I'm still writing books and I'm still active in the Hollywood scene as well as in the security world. Um, still doing a lot of contracting by myself around the world and, uh, you know, find my skills there, um, you know, in life. So, yeah, awesome. I, got, so, I got full days, man. <laughs> you do. So, guys, uh, check him out on YouTube also. Just uh, type in Dale Comstock and uh, look at videos. You'll see a lot of what Dale does and what he's done. Um, Dale, again, thanks for your time, man. Uh, thanks for, for uh, you know, uh, blessing us with this, uh, and I appreciate it, man. All right, brother. Well, appreciate you having me on there, man. Enjoyed it. Thank you, sir. All right. Yes, yeah, sir. All right. We'll talk <laughs> to you soon. Take, take care. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay, everyone. Thanks for listening in. Be good. Be safe. This is Mike Spotter signing off.